Alan, you sure you don't have coffee in there? Man, that's all right. <laughs> Beloved, God's word for today is uh, Mark chapter 15. We're going to read verses 40, or 33 through 47. We are on the penultimate uh, chapter here of, of Mark. We're right here at the end. Uh, if you would, please stand for the reading of God's holy word. Mark chapter 15, verse 33. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock and he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. And the Lord had his blessings. His holy word, God's word, is without error It never fails us. It's all that we need. Let's pray. Father, here we come to that moment. Lord, that moment of the death of our Lord. And it's sad. And it's hard to consider. But Lord, we must consider it. So Father, please give us your spirit. Please give us your spirit so that I might only speak your word and your truth, that we might hear your voice today. And Father, give us your spirit so we might have open ears and open hearts to hear your truth and be changed by your truth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As I've said many times before, I love preaching to you all because you all are so smart. You guys finish this line. Something cannot be found unless it is first what? Lost. There you go. Now, it's been said, and it's been my experience, that when you're sharing the gospel of salvation with people, oftentimes what you have to do is first convince the person that they're lost, that they actually need salvation. So so many today are, are convinced that really they're good enough people. That's, that's the mindset of most people today, that salvation isn't even necessary for them. I, I remember as a young kid actually sitting next to my aunt one time in church, and, and you know, the preacher said, make sure you turn to your neighbor and, and ask your neighbor if they're saved. And she turned to me, and she didn't ask me if I was saved. She said, oh, I know you're saved. You're such a good boy. <laughs> she didn't know nothing. All right? 
What does the Bible say? Scripture does not paint a picture of us as being good enough. It doesn't. You know that. What does the Bible say? The Bible says we're fallen. The Bible says we're without hope in this world. Romans 3.23, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10, none of us are what? Righteous. And then I love that Romans 3.10 doubles down on that. It says, no, not even one. John, this is a very bleak way to start a sermon. I know, I know. But it's an honest way to start it because better to know the truth than to live a lie. But here's some more bleakness. It's not just that we're all lost and we need to be saved. But what do we need to be saved from? Now, if you go to a Sunday school, any Sunday school, and you were to ask that question, what do you need to be saved from? What's the answer going to be? Saved from our sins. You're going to hear that, saved from our sins. Now, that is a biblical answer. Did you realize that's a biblical answer? That's a very biblical answer. Matthew 121, Jesus will save us from our what? Sins. That's a very biblical answer. But what does that mean? Are my sins stabbing me in the back? Are my sins trying to choke me out? Are my sins poisoning me? Are my sins plotting a coup to take over John? Like, what what does that mean, save me from my sins? What it means is that we're saved from the consequence of our sins. Now, what's the consequence of our sins? The consequence of our sins, the Bible tells us, is death. The judgment and wrath of Almighty God. In the garden, Adam and Eve sinned. What's the result? What's the consequence of their sin? Immediately, there's what? Death. Now, some of you might be saying, no. They, they leave. They live, John. I mean, they live for a long time. Eventually, they die, but they live. No, there was death immediately. What did God do? God made animal skins to cover them. Now, I've seen many things, but I've never seen animal skins made from an animal that didn't what? Die. So what did God have to do? Kill to cover their shame. And and I should point out, who did the killing? God did the killing. God brought judgment on an animal instead of who? Instead of them. And His promise was true. If you eat of the the fruit of the tree, you will surely what? Die. They ate of the fruit of the tree and something surely what? Died. Because that's the result of our sin. Now, beloved, again, I hate to start the sermon off with so much, more, so much bleakness, but here's a little bit more bleakness just to start us off. Not only are we all sinners, not only is the consequence of our sin death, the judgment of God, but also the Bible tells us, here's the worst part, we cannot save our what? Ourselves. We can't save ourselves. Romans 3.20, by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight. In other words, there's not anything you can do or I can do. There's no work that we can do that we can save ourselves. So now now the question becomes, if I cannot save myself, then what is God going to do to save me? What does God do to save me? Despite the the Scriptures being crystal clear, on how God saves us through the death of Christ, many people have said that the way God saves us is by purely forgiving us. That's the way God saves us. He just waves his hand and says, forgiven. That's a way most people really do believe God will save. A lot of people view God as, as kind of a celestial grandfather, right? He says, come on up here. And he gets us on his lap. And he says, you know, I know you messed up, but that's okay. And he just waves our, his hand over us and suddenly like, you're all better now. Go on, get out there. Some people even go so far as to say, everyone's going to be saved. Everyone's going to be saved. Here, here, R.C. Sproul talks about that. He says, they think God is so kind and loving that his love is going to swallow up his justice and righteousness and holiness. They think that God must just forgive us without there being any kind of justice 
Otherwise, he's not really good and loving. Beloved, if God saves us without justice, hear me, he's not God. He's not God. If God saves us without any justice, he's not God. Because God is just. Is God loving? Is God loving? Yes, good. I'm glad you know that one, okay? But is God just? He absolutely is. Let me, let me show you the best verse that says this. Exodus 34, verse 7, puts it perfectly. The Lord is a God merciful and gracious and slow to anger. He's abounding. I love that. He's abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. He keeps steadfast love for thousands of generations, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but He will by no means clear the guilty. Exodus 34, 7. Is God loving? Yes. But is He just going to wave His hand and just forget sin? No. See, see it, it seems nice to say that God is just going to acquit the sins of everyone. Right? That seems nice, but that goes against the very nature of God. Let me prove that to you. Somebody steals your car. Somebody steals your car. They take that car for a joy ride. They run over 10, 20, 30 people. Kill them. Then that guy gets caught. And now you're in the courtroom, you're testifying against this guy that stole your car, killed all these people with the car. Everyone in the courtroom's crying, it's families. Everyone knows this man is purely guilty. And the judge stands up there and says, you know, I'm just feeling so kind today. And I think we all should just understand the nature of forgiveness today. I'm just going to forgive this man and just let him go. Now, is that a good judge? No. In fact, you'd be right to say that's an evil judge. That's not a good judge at all. That's an evil judge. Why? Because that sort of forgiveness without justice is not love at all. It's not love at all. What does the Bible say about the Lord? The judge of all the earth, he shall do what? He shall do right. He shall do right. All right, so we have this problem. Hey, I hope you get, get this. I'm just giving you the gospel here at the beginning of the message, right? But we have this problem. We're all sinners. The consequence of our sin is death. We cannot save ourselves. And God is just. He must punish our sin. So how does the Bible say our damaged relationship with God is repaired and forgiven? The Bible, what the Bible presents to us is not like this unjust just dismissal of our sins, what the Bible presents to us is the beautiful, and I emphasize this, beautiful atonement of our sins. Our sins are atoned. God repairs our relationship with Him. How? He satisfies the law's demands. Justice gets served, but out of grace and love, it doesn't get served on us. It gets served on who? On Christ. Theologically, we have a term for this. The term is, are you ready? This is actually a good term to know. Sometimes I tell you, you don't really need to memorize this. This is a good term to know. The term is penal substitutionary atonement. Penal meaning penalty, punishment. Now, you should know this as I'm telling you to learn this term, okay? Penal substitutionary atonement is not something people like. Most of the world hates this concept really truly hate despite the fact that it's very obvious in scripture most of the world hates this concept atheists have called penal substitutionary atonement cosmic child abuse that's a fun phrase the roman catholic church denies this uh, penal substitutionary atonement they call it barbaric and absolute injustice to think that god the father would in any way punish the son But here's the truth, beloved. In this passage, in this passage where we've just read, the wrath of God is palpably obvious. It's right there, and it's being poured out 
on Christ. That's what we just read. Here in this Good Friday in Mark's gospel, God isn't just permitting something to happen. Remember what he did in the garden, like with that animal. God is doing the killing. God is doing the killing to cover our shame. What we see here in this passage is God's judgment is seen, it's heard, and it's felt. It's seen, heard, and felt. There's your three points right there. Let me show this to you. God's judgment is seen. How is it seen? Look right there at the very beginning, verse 33. Darkness covers over the land. From, nine, from the ninth hour uh, to, I'm sorry, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, from noon to 3 p.m., three hours, darkness just settles over the land. Now, where did the darkness come from? Was it just a gloomy day? Was it just some weird natural phenomena? No, this is April in Jerusalem in the middle of the day. This is probably as about as bright a day you can find on planet Earth. Okay, this is not some natural phenomena. Darkness came, why? Because God came there. Because God was present. You go throughout the Old, Old Testament, darkness is a constant picture of God's judgment over and over and over again. You know this. What was one of the plagues on Egypt? What? Darkness covered the land. You won't let my people go? Here's darkness. In Ezekiel, God's still pronouncing judgments on Pharaoh and, and Egypt. He says this, When I blot you out, Pharaoh, I will cover the heavens and make their stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud and the moon will not give its light. All the bright lights of heaven I will make dark over you and put darkness on your land, declares the Lord God. Darkness is a sign of God's what? Judgment. Prophet Nahum describes God's judgment for his enemies as an overflowing flood. He will make a complete end of, their, of the adversaries and will pursue his enemies into what? Darkness. But you know who talks about darkness the most? is Jesus. When Jesus talks about hell, and Jesus talks about hell quite a bit, the judgment of God, how does he describe hell? He describes hell as a place of what? Outer darkness, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. For three hours, what are the people seeing? You might say, nothing, John, it was dark. Yeah, but what they're seeing is the judgment of God coming in darkness. And then the judgment of God is heard. How is it heard? It's heard in the cries of Jesus. Jesus cries out with the Bible says a megalophone, like a big loud cry. He says, "My God, my God, why have you forsaken me?" That's a quote from Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is that famous psalm where David's sufferings are a foreshadowing of Christ's sufferings. But what does it mean to be forsaken? To be forsaken is to be forgotten, it's to be left alone, it's to be cut off, it's to be abandoned, it's to be separated, and that's what the Son is experiencing right now. Some have argued with that. The Son's not experiencing that. There's no way the Son could experience that. Then why did He say it? He said it. Habakkuk tells us God's eyes are too holy to look upon sin. What is Jesus becoming for us right in this moment? Our sin. He that knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Out of judgment, the Lord is abandoning Christ, forsaking him. Isaiah 59, 2. You say, again, in the Old Testament, forsaking is a sign of God's judgment. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve sin, judgment comes. What immediately happens to them? They're what? Kicked out. Forsaken. They're cut off. So the people at the foot of the cross, they, they see the judgment of God come in darkness. They hear it out of the voice of Jesus. They're hearing the judgment of God. But here's the thing. They, they don't know that it's the judgment of God. We know that they don't know. Because some of them, when they hear Jesus cry out, they don't think that he's, that he's crying out to God. They hear Eloi in Aramaic, and they think he's saying Eli. 
They think he's saying Elijah. They think he's calling on Elijah. Now, why would they jump to that conclusion? They jump to that conclusion because in Malachi, there's this idea that Elijah, remember, Elijah didn't die, right? Elijah was assumed into heaven. So there's this idea that Elijah would come and a righteous man that's about to die, he might rescue him and take him into heaven with him. And so they're thinking in their minds, well, let's see if this Jesus is really a righteous man. Let's see if Elijah comes. Then then we'll know. Now, you tell me. Do you think they're actually expecting Elijah to come? They've been mocking him and spinning on him and beating him for hours. They they don't think Elijah's coming. What do they think? They're doing this. (laughs) He's calling on Elijah. Let's see if Elijah comes. That's the attitude that this is said with. More mockery. It's more mockery. And then the crowds at the foot of the cross, they hear one more final cry. Mark doesn't record the words of Jesus' cry, but John does and Luke does. He said, it is finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It is finished is that really famous Greek word, tetelestai. It's not easy to say, but it's famous, right? Tetelestai. It's a perfect passive in Greek. Now, you don't need to understand what that means. I'll I'll just tell you this. What Jesus is saying is this. He's saying, not only is it finished, but it is forever finished. It will forever be finished, is what he's saying. What has been finished? The atoning work has been finished. But what did Jesus say in the garden? Father, if it's your will, I will drink this cup. And what has Jesus just done? He's drunk the cup. He's drunk the cup of God's wrath. Now, if, if you were at the temple, you probably couldn't hear Jesus crying. But if you were up at the temple, miles away, you might have heard something rip at that moment. What you would have heard as Jesus died is the curtain in the temple getting ripped top to bottom. What's this curtain? It was this veil. It was a purple, blue, and red curtain. Almost. Almost red, white, and blue. But purple, blue, and red. Close. It separated the holy place from the most holy place. You guys remember this, right? In the, in the tabernacle and then in the temple, there was always a most holy place. And the most holy place is where God dwelt with his people, right? When, when they had the Ark of the Covenant, they don't have the Ark of the Covenant anymore, but when they had the Ark of the Covenant, it would be there in the most holy place. And over the mercy seat, over the lid of that Ark, God's Spirit would hover there being with the people. And then once a year, the high priest would take the blood of the lamb and he would go into the most holy place most holy place, and he would sprinkle the blood of the lamb on the ark to forgive the sins of the people. And now what just happened? Jesus says it's finished and that curtain is torn. Why? Because no more blood needs to be shed. To tell us die, it's done. Why? Because the blood of Jesus has been shed. It's done. Some people, some people have argued, how does Jesus bear all of our punishment in the span of three hours? Like, aren't, isn't our punishment supposed to be eternal? So how does Jesus bear our eternal punishment in three hours? That's actually a very easy question. You know the answer. Jesus is what kind of a being? He's an eternal being. When did Jesus start? He he never started. He's always been. When is he going to end? He's never going to end. He's always been. So what can an eternal being do? An eternal being can bear an eternal punishment in the span of five minutes if he wants to. But God graciously made it three hours so that people could see. One other thing to note, the curtain that gets torn from top to bottom Why does it get torn from top to bottom? Because God is doing this for us. We're not doing this for God, right? 
It's God who gave us his son. It's God who put his son up on the altar. It is God, just like in the garden, that is doing the killing. It is God that has just made a way for us to have full access to God. Now, and get this, remember, that most holy place, who got to go in there? One high priest once a year, that's it. No one else got to go. If you set foot in there, you would die. And now that curtain's been torn. So what, what's the message that's being given? We now have what? Full access to God. Full access to God. We have so much access. This is what the writer of Hebrews says. If you haven't memorized this verse, memorize this verse. Hebrews 4.16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know what's keeping you from God? Nothing. Nothing. There's no curtain. There's no person. There's nothing. So God's judgment has been seen in the darkness. It's been heard in Jesus' cry. And it's also felt in an earthquake. Say, John, there's no earthquake in this passage. No, I I know that, okay? But in John's gospel, there's an earthquake. I'm sorry, rather, in Matthew's gospel, there's an earthquake. There's a great earthquake when the temple is torn. It's such a startling earthquake, and it's followed by another supernatural event. That not only is there an earthquake, but long dead saints, saints, meaning people who trusted in the Messiah, trusted in the promises of God, long dead saints rise up from the ground. Now, sometimes you say this, and you look at people and go, yeah, this is the part that's a little iffy. No, it's not. It, if, you, if you're going to say that, you're going to say the whole thing's iffy. Long dead saints rise up from the ground, and guess what they did? They go into the city, they're alive, and they go and greet people in the city. Uncle Gary, what are you doing here? Can you imagine that? And Uncle Gary says, I was dead. And like, yeah, I know. No, no, I was dead. The judgment of God was upon me. I was dead. But someone just took the judgment of God for me, and now I'm no longer what? Dead. And that testimony just spread throughout Israel. Wow. Scripture shows us in the Old Testament, there's so many different places. You can look them up. God's judgment is marked by earthquakes. Isaiah 5, 25, the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people. He stretched out his hand against them and struck them, and the mountains quaked. Mountains tremble with God's judgment. You know, beloved, when we, when we think about the cross of Christ, I think what we do sometimes is we think of it as this very sad moment. And it is sad. It is sad to imagine an innocent person being dealt this punishment. It's sad to imagine our Lord that we love experiencing this. But more than sad, we need to understand, this is scary. This is scary. We're not just seeing the love of God on display on the cross. We're seeing the judgment of God. It is palpable in every way. The judgment of God being poured out on Christ. Now, again, I told you that this penal substitutionary atonement, it's obvious in Scripture. It's everywhere in Scripture, but many people hate it today. One of the most common complaints is this. Why would you say that the Father would do something so atrocious to the Son? Doesn't that, like, separate the Trinity Right for the for the father to be hurting the son in this way doesn't that se- this is the Roman Catholics uh, objection to this doesn't that like separate the Trinity and hurt the Trinity absolutely not why not because they're doing this together they're doing this together Jesus himself said this John ten eighteen no one takes my life from me but I lay it down of my own accord I have authority to lay it down. And I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Now, did you catch that? The Father has given the Son a mission, a charge to go and do this, but Jesus has also chosen to do it of his what? 
of his own will and his own accord. So the will of Jesus is not being affected here. The Trinity is not being abused here. The Father is not violating the Son here. They're doing this together. Let me, let me close by reminding you of this. As scary as the judgment of God was, it was also beautiful. Th- this moment at the cross, this was beautiful. Why? Because it's accomplishing for us the atonement, the reconciliation of us to God. And Mark actually illustrates this with two different men. Look here at the end here. First, we see a Roman centurion. Now, this was probably, this Roman centurion, more than likely, this is one of the same 600 guys that was at the governor's palace a few hours ago, beating Jesus, putting a robe on Jesus, a crown of thorns on Jesus, laughing at him, mocking him. There's no reason to think that this man wasn't doing that just a few hours ago, or at least standing there with them while they did that. And, and you know, if you're a Roman centurion, how many people do you think you've seen die? I mean, hundreds? How many people have you seen die on a cross? Probably hundreds. How many people have died at the end of your own blade? But something about the death of this prisoner is different. There's something that this this man, he, 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 he sees the darkness and he hears what Jesus is saying and then he feels the earthquake, Matthew's gospel says, and he He looks up and he becomes the first person in the entire Gospel of Mark. Just real quick, this is really fun. Look back at Mark chapter 1. I know we've been in in Mark for over a year now, but look back at Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the what? The Son of God. The next time a man says that Jesus is the Son of God, is chapter 15. And who says it? A Roman pagan. I mean, there, Mark points out that there's this, these women standing far off and they're watching Jesus from a distance. They're sad and they're confused. We don't have time to go in this, but real quick, why does Mark mention them? Because he's pointing out their, their loyalty to Jesus. The, these women were faithful to Jesus ministering to him for years on the road and now they're standing there we don't we don't hear mention really of 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 the other disciples we know that some of them were there but the women are there they're in faithfulness but this roman centurion is the only one out of all of them that looks up and and sees jesus and says surely this guy this man he's the son of god now beloved Only the Holy Spirit could have opened that man's eyes to say that. Why? In Roman mythology, there is no concept of a singular son of God. There's a lot of Roman gods. A lot of them have kids, but none of them you call the son of God. Also, if you're a Roman and you're looking at someone being crucified, that is the scum of the earth. You would never say about someone crucified, that's a son of God. So what is happening here? The Holy Spirit has opened up the eyes of this man to see who this really is. And then Mark shows us another man, a rich man, Joseph of of Arimathea, who, who takes his own tomb and gives it to Jesus. And we're told Joseph, he's actually a member of the council. What council is that? That's the Jewish council. That's that's the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and all these people that have been trying to trap Jesus and malign Jesus and kill Jesus throughout the entire Gospel of Mark. Joseph is a respected member of them. He's just different. He didn't didn't consent to Jesus being murdered, and he was a righteous man. The Scriptures tell us he was seeking the kingdom of God. John's Gospel even says that he was a disciple of Jesus. Jesus. So what is Mark showing us here at the end? He's showing us this. What can the atonement that Christ accomplishes on the cross do for us? What can it do? What's the power of the atonement? It can take Jesus' greatest enemies and make them loyal followers. That's what the atonement can do. The atonement can take those who are enemies of God 
and make them lovers of God. Colossians 1.21, and you, me, you, were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, but he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Beloved, by his wounds, by Jesus' wounds, by his suffering, by the wrath and judgment of God being poured out on him, we are healed. That's how we're healed. God doesn't just wave his hand. God doesn't just say you're excused. God delivers justice on our behalf. And here's the good news. If you're not reconciled right now, you can be. Why? Because it's finished. All the work is done. You say, well, what do I have to do? Believe. That's it. What, what does the gospel say? The gospel says believe. You say, well, no, surely I've got I've to say something. I've got to do something. No, you have to believe. Jesus even says you have to have the faith the size of a mustard seed. You need to believe. Why? Because that's your only hope is what has already been done, what's already been finished. Believe on Him. Put your faith on Him. Call on Him to save you now. Let's pray. Father, thank You. Thank You so much for the cross. And we thank You for the atonement bought on our behalf. God, we thank you that you are perfect and just and good and that you did everything, you did everything to save us. Lord, as we think of the cross, I, I pray that we would always think of it rightly. God, we would never try to dismiss what is obvious in your word. And Lord, as we think of the cross, I pray we would never just feel sad. But God, we would feel scared and we would feel thankful to know that you, you poured it all out on him and not us. Thank you, Father, for the cross. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're about to sing our last song, and um, before we do, 